My name is Margo Malachowski and my pronouns are she, her. I'm an education and outreach coordinator for the network of the National Library of Medicine in Region 7. Region 7 serves Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, and Vermont. And our office is located at UMass Chan Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts, which we call the heart of the Commonwealth. This webinar is being taught nationally, and we are recording on National Rural Health Day, November 17, 2022. All attendees are muted, but we welcome your questions and comments. Please make comments in the chat and make sure you are sending to everyone or all attendees. Rebecca Brown from our National Training Office is here with me to keep an eye on the chat. So sending to everyone will help Rebecca and me to see your comments. All registrants will receive a link to the recording and the recording and the handout and the slides will be available on the class description page. And uh, Rebecca can drop the link for that. Uh, we hope to make the recording available within the next 30 days. We do have Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday next week, so we'll get it up as soon as possible. Oops, let me just, there we go. Before we get into today's topic, a word about who we are. The National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. The National Library of Medicine is an institute at the NIH. NLM is the world's largest biomedical library, which produces information resources such as PubMed, clinicaltrials.gov, and Medline Plus. NNLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine. We are the outreach program of NLM. The network operates out of seven regional medical libraries, or RMLs. The RMLs offer training and funding opportunities to support equal access to biomedical information. I mentioned in my introduction that I work in Region 7, and we'll drop the link for where you can find your regional medical library. The Public Health Collaborative coordinates public health program programming across the network, including training, guides, and funding. For our public health attendees today, NNLM offers a digital library. The Public Health Digital Library is a collaborative, fee-based program for state, local, and municipal public health departments. Public health departments can gain access to over 290 full-text public health journals and databases like PolicyMap and CABI.org. If your department is interested, Rebecca will drop the email address for more information. And that email address is also on the slides. That will, the slides will be available on the class description page. Today's class is about rural health. Around 14% of people in the United States live in rural areas. I live in a rural area. On this slide is a picture of me shoveling knee-deep snow, I think this was in 2015, in my driveway. And my mailbox is across the road peeking out of a snowbank, and it's a little crookedy because it's been hit by the snow plow. There are many reasons why people live in rural communities. Lower cost of living, a slower pace of life. Rural areas are less crowded and can offer more privacy. You might live in a rural area to be near your family and friends. But there are challenges to living in rural communities when it comes to taking care of your health. Compared to folks who live in urban areas, folks in rural communities are not able to get to a hospital quickly in an emergency, need to travel long distances to get routine checkups and screenings have less access to dentists, and certain specialists might not be available at all. Folks in rural communities have higher rates of certain types of cancer from exposure to chemicals in farming. On this slide is a picture of a bear in the same driveway in the springtime. My forsythia is blooming on the side and the bear is getting into my trash barrel. The photo's fuzzy because I'm taking the picture from my house, inside my house, through a window. 
These are today's learning objectives for what you should be able to do after this webinar. You should be able to describe current demographic trends in rural America. Download data sets and visualizations from health, rural health resources. And find information on health conditions, for demographic groups, and on social issues. Before I begin my presentation, let's hear from you. Please put your comments in the chat. In your experience, in your line of work, what impacts health in rural communities? Is it transportation issues, lack of broadband, lack of insurance, lack of providers, environmental hazards, or occupational hazards? Is there something missing from this list? Um, let me know in the chat. Transportation exclamation point. Yes, transportation. Yeah, distance to care, lack of providers, lack of broadband. Yep. Boy, we're really seeing this transportation issue. Environmental hazards. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, I, I was, a couple of weeks ago, I was out in the Ber in Berkshire County in Massachusetts, and um, and I was hearing that there was that some landline access, landline telephones, um, they were having some problems. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for sharing all of that. I'll be going through my slides for about 20 minutes, and then I will go live to demonstrate searching for and downloading information. First, we will talk about demographic trends in rural America. Let's step back to give a definition of rural, and you'll see from the federal standpoint, the definition is rather indirect. The United States Census Bureau does not define rural. They consider rural to include all people, housing and territory that are not within an urban area. Any area that is not urban is rural. The Federal Office of Management and Budget describes counties that have urban cores of 50,000 or more people as metropolitan or urban. Counties that have an urban core of 10,000 to 49,999 are micropolitan, and that is considered rural. And then, of course, counties outside of metro or micro areas are rural. The link to these definitions is on the handout, which is available to you. Um, and, and maybe Rebecca could drop the link to the handout for today. And that's from the Department of Health and Human Services. These terms, metro and micro and non-metro, come up in other federal resources. So I wanted to give you the definitions at the start, what that actually means. Despite these vague definitions of rural, the United States Department of Agriculture studies rural communities through a research unit called the Economic Research Service, or ERS. This website is a good source of charts and reports that include, but go beyond, farming data. We will look at these resources when I go live. The ERS puts out an annual report called Rural America at a Glance. The report summarizes population trends, employment, po poverty, and income in rural areas. This year's report was released on Tuesday, November 15th, and reviews industry shifts and the rural labor force. In 2021, the report looked at persistently poor counties, as well as the types of counties that are gaining or losing population. Persistently poor counties are less connected to the Internet and are ill-equipped for increases in online communications and commerce. Persistently poor counties tend to be racially and ethnically diverse. The states, the counties with population loss are more dependent on farming, manufacturing, and coal, gas, or oil extraction. In contrast, counties 
that are rural but are seeing population gain in states like Utah, Idaho, Montana, Washington, are seeing growth due to recreation and retirement-based economies. Let me know in the chat if you are in a population gain county or a population loss county. Gain. Okay. Loss, population gain. This issue of uh, population gain, we're going to swing back to in a, in a couple minutes. Okay, we're seeing a lot that are seeing some gain. Interesting. Wide has a picture of my husband splitting our firewood for the winter. Let's talk about the demographics of rural America. In se September 2022, the University of New Hampshire Carsey School of Public Policy released a brief entitled Growing Racial Diversity in Rural America, Results from the 2020 Census. According to the brief, rural America is becoming more diverse. And I'm quoting here, Recent 2020 census data revealed that non-metropolitan counties declined by 288 people between 2010 and 2020. Today, there are 46 million rural residents, which is just 14% of the United States total. This is the smallest perception, a percep and let me try that again. That's, this is the smallest percentage of the population to reside in rural areas in United States history. Though population declines were widespread, rural America became more racially and ethnically diverse over the past decade. Rural population decline occurred in tandem with growing diversity, end quote. On this slide, you will see that the total rural population is 46 million, which is a decrease from 2010. The non-Hispanic white population is 35 million, which is a decrease, and the racial slack slash ethnic minority population is 11 million, which is an increase. Now, what's interesting to add to this is that the Rural America at a Glance report that was released on Tuesday shows that there was a sharp increase in population from 2021 to 2022 after the census data. Why do you suppose there was a sharp increase in rural population? I want to throw your ideas in the chat. Yes, exactly. COVID moves, the pandemic. And um, what re redistricting is an issue. Yeah. And what age range do you suppose saw the biggest um, increase? Like what, who do, who's moving to the rural areas? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Families. What the report was showing is a lot of older people are moving, but when I on the ground, when again when I was out in Berkshire County, I was hearing about a lot of families moving um, into rural areas. All right. Well, thank you for uh, contributing to that. Yes, cost of living. Yes, absolutely. And then, yeah, but then they run up against the internet availability. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the intersection of poverty and race and ethnicity. I did notice that one of the comments about, um, yes, and healthcare avail availability and the availability of people to home health aides and such. Uh, but as somebody had mentioned in the chat earlier about um, language resources, and, and we're hearing that rural areas are becoming more diverse. So let's look at the intersection of poverty and race and ethnicity. This chart is an example of one of the charts that's available from the Economic Research Service, which I will be um, showing you in a few moments. So the, the title of this chart is Poverty Rates by Select Racial and Ethnic Groups, comma, Residents, meaning the chart is showing non-metro and metro poverty rates. So let me know in the chat what you're seeing in this chart. 
groups. Again, we're looking at poverty rates by select racial and ethnic groups. And then looking at the, com uh, the comparison between non-metro and metro. Yeah, more poverty in rural America. Yes, across all rural groups. Yes, for all groups. So I will show you how to grab charts like this when I go live to the website. Yes, I'm checking on the chat. Yes. Okay, let's overlay rural living with health vulnerabilities. The ERS report Rural America at a Glance in 2020 identified four vulnerability sources. And on this slide is a chart from that report. These are great little reports. I encourage you to check them out. Vulnerabilities include a greater percentage of non-metro adults with underlying health problems, a greater percentage of what they're calling old adults, which is defined as 60 and over. And I'm chuckling a little bit because I turned 60 last year, <laughs> and um, which my granddaughter would tell you that I'm old, but that my mother is very, very old, she says. <laughs> All right. Um, double the number of adults without health insurance in rural areas and a significant difference in access to hospitals with intensive care units. As we learned in the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 patients can quickly develop serious symptoms, and rural residents who are remote from intensive care hospitals may have difficulty in receiving care in a timely manner. The report states that people living in these counties, particularly older adults and those with underlying health conditions, may have worse outcomes for severe cases of COVID-19 due to the difficulty of accessing medical care quickly. Okay, so why are rural hospitals closing? According to the American Association report from September, the American Hospital Association report, excuse me, from September 2022, 136 rural hospitals closed between 2010 and 2020 due to low reimbursement rates, staffing shortages, low patient volumes, regulatory barriers, and expenses for labor drugs, supplies, and equipment. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are attempting to address this trend with a new designation of Rural Emergency Hospital, due to become effective in January 2023. This new designation keeps emer emergency departments open in rural counties, but requires the hospitals to stop inpatient services. Let me know in the chat what you've heard about this new designation. And I want to thank uh, Emily for adding a resource into the chat to visualize health data by county from the CDC. And yes, Christine uh, pointed out that the racial gap, gap and poverty is greater in the rural areas. That is also true. Okay, so I'm not seeing um, comments about the rural emergency hospital. So. That is something that's coming up. I know that uh, rural communities really mourn the loss of their community hospitals when they close. So uh, keep your eyes open about what happens in your area around this new designation. We've been talking about demographic trends in rural America, race, ethnicity, poverty, 
and we've been talking about hospital closures. Some of this data came from the USDA Ec Economic Research Service, and I will show you how to download data sets and visualizations from the ERS when I go live. Now I will introduce another website for downloading data sets and visualizations. Rural Health Information Hub is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. This resource specifically looks at rural health information. Your first stop for rural health information is a great source for exploring the topics from the poll that I conducted earlier. Lack of transportation, lack of broadband, lack of providers, and, um, and the other issues that you threw in the chat during um, that time. Our third objective is to find information on health conditions for demographic groups and on social issues. And for those um, topics, I highly recommend Medline Plus. Medline Plus is a consumer health website that is developed by the National Library of Medicine. Pictured here is what Medline Plus looks like on your computer and what Medline Plus looks like on your phone. There's no advertising on the website, and Medline Plus does not endorse any companies or products. Medline Plus offers information in English and in Spanish on over a thousand health topics, as well as information on human genetics, medical tests, medications, and dietary supplements. Medication, uh, Medline Plus provides links to languages beyond English and Spanish, but the resources are not as deep. I will show you how to locate information on health conditions such as mental health, which I'm hearing a lot about in rural communities. For demographic groups such as older adults, we know that rural communities are aging. And social issues such as the rising availability of cannabis in rural communities, both as a source of income and, um, and tax revenue. And, and But we will be looking at uh, it, resources to help us understand the health impact and concerns about pollutants in our waterways. Before we move on to our demonstration portion of the webinar, if you're interested in doing health-related community programs or staff development programs, please consider reaching out to the network of the National Library of Medicine. We can provide tailored training in health information resources for your workplace and funding for your community outreach. The network offers funding to libraries, schools, faith-based organizations, and community-based organizations that are tackling the impact of opioids, dementia, food insecurity, the rise of housing costs, and the lack of internet access. So Rebecca has dropped the link for finding where your region is. And I'm just taking a quick look at the chat before I, um, good, I'm, I've got a shout out for the Rural Health Hub. Yes, and yeah, the buyouts for the hospitals. Yes. Okay, let me change what I am sharing here. So Rebecca, are you seeing the Economic Research Service? Yes. So I know. Yeah. Oh, cool. Good. All right. So we will be looking at three websites today. And the first one is the Economic Research Service from the USDA. So the link is ers.usda.gov. And um, what the first thing you might be seeing on this website is uh, the, um, sorry, I'm just losing, I lost my mouse here, is uh, the, the scrolling um, visual. And then at, in the middle of the, um, the uh, right below that image, you'll see four tabs. One says reports, another says data, and the th there says charts and maps. And we will be looking at a couple of these tabs. So right underneath reports, I'm going to click on Rural America at a Glance, the um, 2022 edition. And here you'd be able to download the entire report um, as a PDF. I, these are, you know, I think it's 18 pages. They're really handy little um, reports that I would, oops, I'm sorry. Why am I, 
I'm going to stop sharing for a second if I can feel. For some reason, my mouse is not. I'm sorry. Things are going wacky. I am not able to. What's happening here? One thing you might want there. to do is turn off your camera and might help yeah. your bandwidth and. Okay, I'm going to try again. Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't, what was happening was I wasn't seeing my, my, where my cursor was, which was really strange. Okay, let me try this again. My apologies. All right, here we go. Let's see if this works better. Okay, this is working better already. All right, so I was, um, I was showing you where the Rural America at a Glance edition. Are you seeing that, Rebecca? Is that working? Yes, yes. We got the report okay, page. Cool. All right. So um, here's where you can grab the PDF of that report. This one is 24 pages. And they're really nice, handy reports. Um, to And each year they take on a different um, topic in, in, in what's happening in terms of the trends. On this data tab, if I click on that and I scroll down to where it says state fact sheets, there's a couple of different ways of looking at these state fact sheets, which have a lot of census data as well as uh, farm characteristics. Now, this might be useful to you if you are writing a report or you're doing your own presentation about your area or um, if you are applying for a grant. You can select your state from this map or from this A to Z list, or you can do what they call enter the app. I'm imagining if you're using this on a, on a phone or, um, or a, an iPad or a tablet, that you would just tap on that. It is defaulted to all of the United States, but here I'm going to just select uh, California. And I want to point out to you that the data was last updated on November 1st. In the, at the top, we're getting census data, but what's handy here is you're getting population data from 1980 and down to 2021. Then income information, food and security information, education, and again, you're getting all of these years handy, handy for you. Um, employment, and then you get this uh, uh, farm characteristics, including um, the characteristics of principal farm owners, operators, uh, with regards to age and also gender. And then you get the top uh, uh, crop production and um, and the top com the top commodities for agriculture. I am going to scroll all the way up to the top of the page. So if that sort of thing bothers you, close your eyes. <laughs> All right, I'm up at the top. If you want to download this data, there's a little disk icon here. And if you click on that, you can download this data as an Excel a spreadsheet, as a PDF, or as a CSV um, spreadsheet. All right, I will go back to um, home. Again, um, here we looked at the Rural America at a Glance report. And under data, we looked at the state fact sheets. And the last thing I'm going to look at, and I know this is just a snapshot of this uh, website, but is the charts. I'm going to select charts of note. And here I want to, uh, the best way to grab these images, if you want to use them in a report of your own or in a presentation, or if you're writing for a grant, is just to right click and save the image. All of these images are, uh, 
are offered from the federal government from, in this case, the USDA. Um, so there's no copyright issues or anything. They're free to, for you to use. And, um, and we can filter by topic. I, I will filter in a moment, but you can see that there's a chart and there's an explanation on what the chart is. And then it tells you where the data is coming from and it links to that, uh, to the location of the data. So this first one is Thanksgiving is filled with food activities while non-food shopping is popular on Black Friday. A lot of these are, uh, you know, agriculture, agriculturally relate. What that might be of interest to you is the rural economy and, and population and also food choices and health. So just to look at a sample of rural, a rural economy and population. And I notice when I'm downloading um, this, these charts of notes, sometimes it takes a second for the, uh, the chart to appear. But the first three are shared a share of working age population in non-metro areas declined from 2010 to 2020. And again, we get a description plus the chart. Counties with high veteran po poverty rates tend to be non-metropolitan. And here we have a map and uh, where the map is, or where the data came from. And the third is rural young women show increases in higher ed educational attainment compared to rural young men. And again, the chart and where the, the data came from and an explanation of the chart. All right, let's take a look at food choices and health. We get this Thanksgiving story again. And after two decades of decline, of, over, of overall decline, the U.S. vegetable availability increased in 2020. And this map of more than half of U.S. counties had at least one farmer's market that accepted credit cards in 2018. Okay, so that is a very quick look at um, the Economic Research Service. Um, I, I hope I piqued your curiosity if this is a new website for you. Um, let me know in the chat how this website might be useful to your work, if you can think of anything. I'll, I'll give you some time to think about it. Yeah, new to you. Okay, cool. I think it's uh, it's there. The charts are really great, and uh, it's really worth uh, spending some time exploring what is available. Yes, uh, good for students, public health research. Okay, so I'm getting um, offices, state offices of rural health. Thank you for sharing the link. All right, we are going on to the second um, website that we'll be looking at today, which is the, uh, the Rural Health Information Hub. This is another uh, good website for finding some data visualizations. And then we will also be looking at these evidence-based toolkits which address some of the concerns we talked about at the beginning of the webinar. So under the rural data visualizations, the chart gallery, you can filter the chart gallery by topic, by state, and by type. So if we look at the chart gallery by topic, I will select D for dental workforce. I know that that's a big issue in rural uh, counties. And you will see there's only three charts available here, but you can look at both the whole country and then there are state versions available. And, um, and in a moment, I will get into one of these, um, these map-based visualizations and we'll talk about how you can manipulate the map and download it. 
You can also search by state. So if you are in North Carolina and want to look at uh, charts that are specifically addressing um, North Carolina, you can choose the state and then you can narrow uh, by topic. And when you see these topic lists, you'll see the name of the topic and then a uh, number in parentheses. So that will tell you how many charts are, uh, are addressing that topic. So we have 11 for the health workforce. So if I click OK, these will take you to charts that are sp specific to North Carolina that are talking about health professional shortage areas. All right, I'm going to go back to narrowing by type. There are three types. There are bar charts, line charts, and maps. I'm particularly fond of maps, so I will show you the maps. And let's take a look at uh, the Asian population map. So here we're defaulted to national, although we could select a um, a state if we wanted. It's also um, defaulted to all counties, but we can change the map from uh, metro, non-metro. This is the Asian population from the 2020 census. Here are the metro, the counties that are defined as metro. And here are all again. Now the lighter color is uh, a, a lower amount of population, so it's 0 to 3%, whereas the darker is over 12%. And you can um, download the image here, or you can download the data as a CSV file. You can s explore other years. So here, again, we're uh, defaulted to Asian population national, all counties in 2020. Let's say we want to look at the non-metro, and here's 2020. We can go back in time to 2015 and to 2010. You can also mouse over the map and see uh, the data here, too. And again, you can download the images or save the data. And the, the, um, a table of the data is located below the image. All right, so I will move on now to showing you the evidence-based toolkits for those of you who are, who are doing outreach to rural communities. This is one of the strengths of the Rural Health Information Hub. There are toolkits uh, we will look at, uh, let, let me take a look at this top one, uh, the Rural Community Health Toolkit to explain what they are. All of the toolkits include modules. So in this one, it's creating a program, developing a program, implementing, evaluating, planning for funding and sustainability, and dissemination, which is really how to tell your story. One thing I do want to call to your attention is looking at the last reviewed date. And here we see that this was last reviewed in June of 2022. If I go back to the list of evidence-based toolkits, we'll see there are toolkits for a lot of the topics that we've been talking about, aging in place. Um, here's one on community health workers in, communi in uh, rural communities. Um, early childhood, this is a brand new one, emergency preparedness, health literacy, maternal health, mental health, opioid use disorder, oral health. So these are toolkits that are, are worth exploring if, if you're looking at doing some outreach. I do want to show you the telehealth toolkit because telehealth just exploded during the pandemic. But if we look at the toolkit, we'll see that this particular toolkit was published in May of 2019, which was before the pandemic. 
but the rural health, the folks at the Rural Health Information Hub have done us a great favor. They haven't updated the toolkit yet, but they've told us they are pointing to, uh, for more information, a topic guide on telehealth use in rural health care. I will click on this link. And again, I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page. So avert your eyes if that bothers you. Okay, so this was last reviewed in July 2021, which still, given the great changes we've had in the past couple of years, um, so is a little bit older. But what I um, want to point out, link right here at the bottom for the National Conference of State Legislatures, which are, is offering state-level information on telehealth coverage and reimbursement policies with links to resources and to contact your regional telehealth resource center. Um, so is telehealth uh, seeing a, a surge in interest in your community? I know each state is handling things differently. Somebody has, um, is commenting about the difficulty of getting a dental appointment. Yes. Um, and in my area, uh, vision appointments are also, to see an eye doctor is also very difficult. Yeah. So one thing I've been hearing is that there are some public libraries. Yes, somebody has commented on that. Yeah. Public li libraries are um, looking to provide space for telehealth appointments. So I, that is one area that the network of the National Library of Medicine is looking to support. So I encourage you, if you're looking for funding or educational opportunities around telehealth, to keep in touch with the network of the National Library of Medicine. I know in, in Region 7, we funded to help a library create a space for the VA to uh, connect with veterans at a public library. Okay, so we are going to move on to the third website of the day, which is Medline Plus. Okay, so Again, Medline Plus is a consumer health website. And uh, for those of you who are, I'm excited to show it off to those of you who might be new to Medline Plus. This is obviously what it looks like on the computer. If you were looking at it on your phone, you would see these buttons uh, on health topics, drugs and supplements, genetics, medical tests, everything from blood tests to ex explanations about MRIs or different kinds of imaging tests a medical encyclopedia, and even some healthy recipes. There is a Spanish language version, so the address is medlineplus.gov. If you want, you can either toggle to the Spanish language version or it's medlineplus.gov slash Spanish for the Spanish version. My favorite way to search Medline Plus is just to use the search uh, bar here. So I am going to look at mental health. Now, when I put a search term in the search bar here, I've pulled up it, my first hit. It looks like a file folder, and it says mental health here and a description of mental health. I will click on where it says mental health, and this is what a health topics page looks like. They all look like this. We're looking at the mental health page, but it could be a uh, physical health uh, condition such as diabetes or colon cancer or, or any type of um, mental or, or physical health condition. Up at the top, there are subject headings. This is a long website, uh, well, a long web page of links. So uh, if you want to just jump down to what you're particularly interested in, you could click on one of these um, headings. All of the health topics have a Spanish version. The health topics pages start with a summary of whatever topic you're looking at. And after the summary, there is a link of reliable resources for you to 
click on and link out to. These are resources that have been selected by people at the National Library of Medicine or subject experts at the National Institutes of Health. So I recommend going here instead of Googling because all of the, the results that you're going to get are vetted resources. And you will get more than one from more than one source. So you're not just getting what one health writer is writing. You are getting resources in this case from the American Academy of Family Physicians, from the Department of Health and Human Services, from the Mayo Foundation, from the American Psychological Association. And then along the side here, you are getting suggesting suggestions for related health topics. So this is different than if you are in a commercial website such as WebMD, where these whatever's on the side could be anything that you Googled or could be something that's targeted to you based on your age and gender. The National Library of Medicine really wants to help you focus on the topic that you are interested in rather than kind of distracting you by other topics on the side. So in this case, I want to drill down to learn more about mental disorders. And I'm coming to a mental disorders uh, health topics page. Again, I could switch to the Spanish version if I was looking for Spanish language materials. In the encyclopedia on the side here, there's different therapies and disorders. There's additional health topics on things like uh, compulsive gambling, on um, post-traumatic stress disorder, self-harm and suicide. And if you're looking for something to be able to print out for someone, as I used to work in public libraries and I was always looking for something that would print out well for people, I would encourage you to look for the notation where it says PDF. And this will take you, in this case, to the American Psychiatric Association where you can um, have a printable version of the resource, which opens up a PDF. Okay. I will go back and do a search on seniors. And when I searched on seniors, I did not get one of those file folder looking results. I got, an, instead I got a list of, you know, almost 15,000 results. I will narrow it by health topics because I would like one of those health topics pages. And I see there are 13 health topics pages that are mapping to the word seniors and they're using the phrase older adult. I um, So there's exercise, mental health, nutrition, healthy aging, elder abuse, glaucoma. Let's take a look at the older adult health. And here again we could um, toggle to the Spanish version. And in the medical encyclopedia, we see how aging affects every part of you. Um, your hearing loss, body shape, um, immunity, skin, sleep. And, and so a lot of these are actionable consumer level information links. But if you are supporting students, as I see some folks are, uh, there's also on each health topics page uh, links for statistics and research. In this case, we're, and again, multiple sources. So we have the National Center for Health Statistics, the Federal Interagency Forum on Age Related Statistics, and the CDC. I have two more searches for you, and one is on cannabis. Now, when I search on cannabis, I did get one of those file folder results, but it was labeled marijuana. So they're, they're mapping me to the term that they are using, just the same as I was using seniors before and I got older adults. So here, again, we have the summary of how do people use it? What are the effects, short-term and long-term? 
Can you overdose? Is it addictive? And what is medical marijuana? So here we have information from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and also uh, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. I want to show you a peek at this. So this is an institute at the NIH that looks at alternative medicine. And it is looking at, at it through the lens of what do we know in science. And for those of you who are either are very, are very much into alternative medicine, integrative medicine, or are working with populations that are, it can be a little frustrating because the truth is we don't always have a lot of scientific evidence. But it's always worth a, a look, particularly if you are looking at interactions with uh, medications that you might be on. Also, just out of curiosity to see how these substances are being studied. So, um, for example, down here, there are sections summarizing research on cannabis and cannabinoids for particular health conditions. So um, this might be worth taking a look at if um, you, you I've either your own curiosity or if you're working with folks that are interested in the topic. There's also information from the National Cancer Institute. And um, and I, you know, I'm, I already mentioned I'm 60. So when I was a teen, there was a lot of talk about marijuana it being used to treat glaucoma. So here is a link out to the American Academy of Ophthalmology and their take on it. And um, and basically, they think uh, it's not practical. <laughs> you need to keep uh, the pressure in your eye at a constant, and you would have to. Um, take a lot of THC in order to achieve what you can get with the medication. So but I thought I would uh, bring that up because I know um, I mean, the laws are changing all over the country. And I, um, it's time for us to take a look at the health information around cannabis. OK, uh, the last topic I wanted to uh, bring up is water pollution. So here I am searching on water. I did not get one of those file folder uh, results, but I will uh, narrow by health topic here. And the, t the top ones are drinking water, water safety, uh, water pollution, and even cephalus. So let's look at water pollution. Again, um, we could look at the resource in Spanish. Here we are uh, getting resources from multiple um, resource, uh, you know, institutions, US Geological Survey. This one I particularly like from the NIH, Safe Water and Your Health. And these are all uh, the different ways in which our, our water can become polluted. So if that is something that's happening um, in, in your area, I know there's a lot of concern about PFAS in water. I know out in the Berkshire County, um, there was environment, um, industry pollution of PCPs in one of the rivers. So this is another place for folks to take a look for information. Okay, so once again, um, if if this is if Medline Plus is new to you, or if it's not, can you think of ways in which it might be useful to your work? I know that was a quick tour. Patient education resource for families, yes. Oh, good. You're pointing students to it. Yeah.
Oh, it's good to hear that you use it in classes. That's great. Yes. When I discovered it when I was working in public libraries, I really loved it. I was wishing there were more databases that were set up the way Medline Plus was for, on different topics for public libraries. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.